earliest picture of the common room, a newly appointed Ralph in front of the long demolished stone arch by Old Chapel. Manual mowing before the original building, the very first teen photograph. Ralph's apartments, now schoolhouse, were not to be added until 1901. Old Chapel, in all its pre-Raphaelite glory, now lost. Every OB who fought worshipped here. Little change, but my study is where the hedge is. Headmaster's house left, Millington's beloved rockery and big school, sandstone and a finer building than appears on first sight. The fascinating interior, commemoration, assemblies, locker, all took place here, and the names of the dead were read out too. The eleven born to lead. It was said that the Battle of Waterloo was won on the playing fields of Eton, the First World War partly on Lower Charford. An astonishing percentage who were to die played in the only two teams of the time. They were thinner then. A sleek first 15, gods to the school. Playing Birmingham University, Big Side has not changed. An extraordinary photograph. Note the early schoolhouse logo. The idyllic playground, gymnasium and fire court. Newly formed, many would fight. Cadets below a dirigible at camp. A spreckly. The contingent. Ralph and his boys. An elite to rule an empire. A remarkable photograph of schoolhouse with bearded headmaster Hendy about to hand over the torch to Ralph as head. The remarkable team. All fought. Six died the first proper teaching block. It is a century old next month. Classes began using it in between an assassination and the guns of August. It was a hot day, the kind of day on which one can see the heat quivering over the dusty roads and hedges. And the only sound that disturbs the stifling quiet is a motor horn, and even that seems hot and tired. Therefore, being wise, we had retired to the most secluded retreat, the library. And there we sat with that old world atmosphere around us, and thought of the many scenes that that room had witnessed. By chance, we picked up an ancient volume of the Bronze Grovian, and read in it the writings of our predecessors. And then we passed in our thoughts to the present and to the future. But perhaps in years to come, some future Bromsgrovian would come on some far distant summer's day to, to think the same things of us. Nay, might even read these very words and wonder what we were like. We who lived at the time of the Great War. And feel a certain pride in all those who fought it, and in those names they saw in all those pages of the volumes set about with a deep black ink and from that same pride, might gain resolution to carry and hand on more worthily the torch, which these had kept burning bright and passed on unsung. When school broke up, no one expected war. The editor of the Bronze Grovian could write confidently. We ourselves are dreaming of seven weeks glorious rest, of the briny sea and of all its pleasures, and by the time this appears in print, those dreams will be very near fulfilment. Is it not, therefore, our duty to wish everyone the best of weather and the best of everything during the long summer holidays? And thus ended peacetime. During the holidays, war began, and by November, there was a very different editorial. Never have our predecessors been faced with such a situation as we are. In face of nations at death grips, Words fail us, and the complaint we have now is not lack of subject matter, but such overwhelming quantity as defies the limits of ordinary prose. 
all those who have just left us, together with many of whom we only know the names, and who left many years ago, are serving the King in all positions. Some are at the front, and one has already met his death in a manner worthy of the best traditions of the school. The keenness of patriotism is not only displayed by OBs, but among present members of the school. Many long to enlist, only prevented by age and parental authority. Their energies find outlet in the work of the OTC, which is being trained with doubled effort and whose numbers are considerably increased. Football, though by no means discouraged, having to give way to military efficiency. The school is changing the physical appearance too. The most notable and gratifying thing is the rapid progress of the headmaster's new house and the successful completion of most of the alterations necessitated in order to connect it with the Littleton house. The quad is about to be enclosed. The first obituary. Lieutenant Ralph Lesingham Spreckley, Connaught Rangers, killed in action 14th of September. 15-11, Head Monitor, Colour Sergeant, OTC. His parents were well-known brewers in Worcester and presented a reading desk to his memory. And here it is in front of me. The Worcester Herald. Worcester should know the glorious details of the death of one of her sons. One fellow, Spreckley, earned the military cross twice over before killed. He was hit in the leg, went back and got dressed, and hobbled up to the fire line, cheering his men on. He was hit again and did ditto, getting back just as his fellows were breaking. He rallied them and drove the Germans on, only to be shot when the situation was safe. In football prospects... The fight has begun on a vaster field than that of rugby and our struggles, struggles must sink into comparative insignificance and suffer. Our complaint is that we do want to fight, but war has wiped out our match list. Our weapons must be the worst for lack of use. The backs have seen too little of each other to combine perfectly, and the workmanship of the two strands is for the same reason necessarily backward. Bronze Rover is served in regiments wonderfully diverse and historic. The Royal Flying Corps, Worcestershire Regiment, 7th Welsh Fusiliers Regiment, Birmingham City Battalion of the Royal Warwicks, Motor Ambulance, Royal Anglesey Artists Rifles, Public Schools Battalion Royal Fusiliers, Liverpool Scottish, New Zealand Force, Munster Fusiliers, Oxford and Bucks Light Infantry, the 51st Zeeks, and the Saskatchewan Regiment. The war was closely followed by the boys. The headmaster is giving a series of instructive talks which are much appreciated. Large-scale maps of the theatres of the war have been placed in kiteless. Mr Isley has kept the positions of the opposing forces accurately marked up to date. They had expected the boys home by Christmas, but in December... A whole term has passed and Europe is still in the throes of the greatest war the world has ever seen. So far, it has not made any great outward difference to the seclusion of school life, which continues its daily round much as usual. Though few are as yet at the front, OBs already have won honours in the firing line, DSOs gained by Dent and Russell, to whom we offer our heartiest congratulations. The headmaster gave a morning off in honour of them. Thousands of Belgian refugees flocked to our shores and some to Bromsgrove, where the townsfolk rallied to assist. And Isaiah Burnell, our director of music, a composer and friend of Elgar, arranged a concert, the Bronzegrove Messenger. As was to be expected of any concert directed by Mr Burnell, the programme was full of good items, exceedingly well done. It raised £6, £500 today. New library books were dominated by war. Warships and their story. The Royal Navy. Why we are at war. Germany and the next war, from the trenches, Germany and England, and famous land fights. As 1914 ended, only one OB had died so far. Mr. Ralph was on the move. We congratulate the headmaster and Miss Ralph upon their removal into the new house. We have had the privilege of inspecting it, and all we could say was that we should be very glad to live that ourselves. We hear that even the workmen were attacked with violent envy for the lucky possessors. Machiavelli wrote, Wars begin when you will, but 
but do not end when you please. The debating society tackled the motion that the war is not likely to last more than to the end of the present year. Prophetically, Mackay stated that Belgium was one mass of concrete trenches through which the Allies would have the greatest difficulty in pushing back the Germans. The President noted Trench warfare might last indefinitely. A great honour for the school was announced for someone who died in what is now a Taliban stronghold, War Office 24 July. His Majesty the King has been graciously pleased to award the Victoria Cross to the undermentioned officer. Captain Jotham, in the team seated left of Kidderminster and Sandhurst, embarked for the northwest frontier. 37 mounted infantry of the Northern Waziristan militia were sent with three British officers to relieve an isolated outpost threatened by a large tribal army of up to 10,000. Retreat was essential at the gap if our troops were not to be surrounded and cut up. The attempt was made in three parties, the last being Jotham. His commanding officer wrote, He lost his life in a gallant attempt to save an unhorsed soul. There was time for him to have got through alone, but the delay allowed the enemy to swarm down from the cliffs and fire from close range. It was a glorious death to have died. He killed seven of the enemy before his death, and we are all proud of him and grateful for him for setting such a magnificent example, especially valuable in a critical time like the present. A letter from a Major Hill to Jotham's father is equally remarkable. Our acquaintance only lasted six hours, but I summed up your son as one of the most striking men that I had ever met. In 1913, I was in the rear coach of the Glasgow Express, which was telescoped by the Edinburgh Express at Aceville. Sixteen people were killed. I noticed a man working with ceaseless energy and club on top of a compartment already in a mass of flames, handing out the poor people the while talking to them as if nothing was at stake and cheering them with kind words. His hair singed, his coat and cap on fire, working quite unconcernedly to the last. This was your boy. Hill later received a regimental card from him. It is hard to be shut up in a sun-baked fort when I long to be in France, where I hope you now are. Hill wrote, but... To my sincere regret, the letter was returned, marked deceased, killed in action. Hearing of his photograph in the Illustrated London News, I write to you. Had he died with less honour to himself and glory to his country, I should have been surprised. I had never met a man who filled me with greater confidence in his personality and strength of character. He was one of those Englishmen who for centuries have made this country famous and have made and extended our vast empire without thought for himself <coughs> and with no blowing of trumpets. I am proud and glad to have met him and shall carry his memory with me until my death. I then hope that I shall again meet him. If you have a photograph of him and can spare one, I shall be most truly thankful to you. The Victoria Cross was presented to his father by King George V at Buckingham Palace he is buried in the Miran Shah Cemetery in Pakistan, commemorated on the Delhi Memorial in India, and a plaque is in the Garrison Church at Whittington Barracks at Litchfield. And in front of this lectern is that VC, which will be on display at the interval. A change in the interval. Dear Sir, that for which many of us laboured has been gained the abolition of the old blazer and the introduction of a pale blue one. We have nothing but praise for this innovation, but we suggest that on the pocket of the, of the blazer, the letters BS in white would be added, that for which we crave. Dear sir, in view of the present Zeppelin scare and the electric light system now prevailing, is it too much to expect to have our old friend, the school motorsport, illuminated by a shaded electric light instead of a feeble and somewhat distant gas lamp? The war was deeply frightening. <laughs> more and more each day is the reality of war being brought home to us here at school. When it began, it was affirmed that it would be waged at no light cost, and this we now realise to the full. It is hard for a school to appreciate such great external disturbances, except insofar as their friends, relations or daily necessaries are affected. 
But we too now begin to see the stern side. The head monitor of last term is already on service abroad. The two drums to your right are the original drums from 1915. But the CCF at that time was digging trenches below the Pythos. Which provided intense enjoyment until the novelty wore off, together with the skin from their hands. Nevertheless, all were most proud of their own sections and most reluctant to fill them in again. The OB Cigarette Fund has sent cigarettes to Kerwood and Pilcher. It was a harsh spring, but... The snow gave us a chance of experiencing the almost unprecedented joys of tobogganing. Thirty of us managed to snatch a day of it. Meanwhile, technology proceeded apace. A new era has been marked by the universal introduction of synchronised electric clocks. As there are clocks in the quad, in the schoolhouse, dining hall, on the Kikis building, which is in full view of Gordon House, and in all the new classrooms, it is now impossible, theoretically, to be late for anything. In a reading of Much Ado About Nothing in the Headmaster's Dining Room, Miss Ralph gave a delightful rendering of Beatrice. She so brought out the character of the vivacious and capricious young lady to perfection, and we wish the society, in general, would acquire her art of reading so naturally and skilfully as to make us think, as we shut our eyes, that we are in the streets of Messina. Bach was heavily criticised. His whole idea seems to be to get to the end of his speech as quickly as decently possible. He is improving, but this cannot be said of Gurney, who struggles painfully and with apparent difficulty to the end of his speeches, and, what is worse, stumbles over the words. Sports day was in March. The mile ended as usual close to the pavilion. Watson was expected to win, and did not disappoint his supporters. Five minutes, four seconds. The OTC met King Edward's contingent in a very heavy snowstorm for operations and they took part in a recruiting parade in the town together. Ralph lost his first boy in Gordon, his first head of house. Win Owen came from India with the Garwal rifles. At dawn he fell, just as the German trench was reached, at the head of his men. Of the 550 who went into action, 180 returned. One officer alone remained. OB Egypt reported, There's been quite a nice little scrap here at last. A plea that... The post box be placed in a more convenient position, that at the end of a long dark tunnel full of perils in the shape of frogs and other public dangers, only to be braved at imminent risk to life and limb, and also being made for lockup. Humphrey Humphreys survived the war, had attended Birmingham and Harvard, became Vice Chancellor of Birmingham, and his portrait hangs outside the headmaster's study. From Alexandria. I would sooner have been near Cairo, where there would have been more in the way of antiquities. I had a thoroughly enjoyable and interesting voyage. It finished uneventfully, though we went on losing a horse or two every day from ship in Monium. I managed to save all ours except one, which arrived alive but was too weak to stand up, and had to be shot on the quay. It is very hot by day, but nights are delightfully cool, and we sit and sleep on the sand. We cling to the flesh pots of Egypt, and having pigged it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we trudge every evening through a mile of sand to dine like Christians in a hotel. Many thanks for your wishes for my birthday. I never anticipated that I should enter on the thirties, the anteroom of middle age, in such an outlandish spot as this. There is little prospect of anything happening on any scale. Our chances of any considerable excitement here are, at present, small. June. There stole upon our ears an indefinable sound, almost impalpable and yet increasingly insistent. A sound which jarred discordantly on our high flights of thought. At first we paid no heed to it, but its everlasting note gradually forced itself on our senses. The corn crank. Here at last was a topic quite original and one that could hardly fail to procure the sympathy of all whose daily tasks take them to the Kyphus building. Rumours have reached us of nocturnal excursions to track it to its lair, but judging by the increased vigour of the bird's tune, <coughs> it has safely eluded all its enemies. Yours of the sleepless nights, suggested. Might not the call be turned out one day with fixed bayonets and blanks to hunt our enemy at home, 
the corn crib. An editorial moves us. We would apologise that we have made no mention of the war, for the reason that we thought it would be a pleasure to see something in print that contains no allusion to it. Barrington Ward was surgeon in charge of the Serbian Relief Hospital at Skopje. We arrived to find Serbia in an awful state. Typhus was raging, hardly controlled by a handful of English doctors and a few nurses. The mortality among doctors and nurses had been exceedingly heavy, and the reason was not far to seek. Sanitation did not exist. The hospitals were packed and the patients untangled. The Serbian is rather a fine person. They're extraordinarily like children. I've heard it said that if you can appreciate the 16th century, you will like Serbia. They're certainly medieval in many things, and the peasant soldier, they're all soldiers, is a great dog-like trusting creature. They're as hard as nails and take anaesthetics as easily as children. Life here is really good fun. I have to administer 50 people besides do the surgery. We're a fairly contented lot, all things considered. Conferred by the King of Serbia, he received the Order of St. Saviour. There were staff shortages. Dr. Fulford comes down every weekend from Devonshire to take chapel services and classes in English. 54-year-old Rear Admiral Grogan was the oldest OB to die, and a newspaper in Toronto reported... The veteran sailor fell overboard from his ship in Dover, Dover Harbour, said Admiralty. Of Henry de Stair Head. It was only the other day that Head was with us. As cricket captain, mainstay of the 15, foremost athlete, school monitor, the straightest of fellows, he took a large place in the hearts of his contemporaries and represented our best traditions. He went to France, since which he has been in the thick of things. The end came to him not in fair fight, but in the foul poisoning of gas. His splendid constitution struggled for a week, and there were moments of hope but he died at the clearing station at Bayer. In July, anyone visiting the cricket field will be startled by the holding, instead of the peaceful scene of an out-of-date horse slowly hauling the mower, a brilliantly painted red and green monster snorting round the field at a pace enough to make the old hoss turn in his grave. Cost 31 pounds. The Literary and Dramatic Society read A Midsummer Night's Dream. Apparently, Anything that pertains to making love does not appeal to most members of the society. Hull saw Redpuck extremely well, though he might have been a little more fair A letter from wife of an old bronze broker reflected on the picture. He is quite unknown to me, but in a quiet English way of stating the manner of his death, surely one reads yet another very gallant gentleman. Commemoration Day, Tuesday, 27th of July. A notable item was the use for the first time of the bidding prayer, read from the pulpit before the sermon. There were none of the usual ceremonies after the service. In the afternoon, the call was inspected by the trustees and camp at Charford. The scene moves us. Anyone would have been struck by two features. Firstly, the rain. Secondly, the gramophone. Our thanks are due to the headmaster for the way in which he came down, morning and evening, wet or fine, to take prayers. Thanks were expressed to Mrs. Bullock for the trouble she took in managing the canteen and for the excellent food she supplied us. We fed like kings, nay, better, for what is more enjoyable than to come home after a long wet day, wet and hungry, and to sit down on one's bedding to a good steaming meal. Field operations were at Trent and on the leaves. We returned at three, after which there was free time for bathing and tennis, or anything else that pleased. Hi tea at five, Retreat at 7.10 when the guard paraded. Sing song occupied the time from retreat until 9, when we gathered round the pavilion steps for evening prayers. Hot cocoa and biscuits were issued, and we turned in at 9.45. The weather forced us to billet in tightness, with a call slept on the floor of the upper corridor and three of the four rooms. It was an always cheerful, keen camp. Tents stretched drum tight with rain, nights spent in the kiteless corridors, route marches where cakes were essential, sentry duty at 1am on a pouring wet night, with creepy shadows and eerie moaning of the wind all around them. All very jolly, you know. Major Charlesworth, this was one of the family properties. After Magdalen College, Cambridge, 
joined the family comedy firm, but a few years later retired, travelling widely and shooting big game in East Africa. He volunteered immediately and met his end while leading two companies to a special attack. SRV Travers is of distinguished appearance, but actually suffered a very bad eye injury in our lamps. He joined the Munster Fusiliers and was killed by a sniper at Gallipoli, his brother standing right beside him. He was head of schoolhouse and football captain. No one who had watched his grief of his 50 could doubt that he would show himself a dashing leader of men, or that in the hottest place he could be at his cruise. He was as full of resource as he was of courage, and would have developed into an officer of unusual capacity. His younger brother, here in his study, known for school time, they were Irish gentry from County Cork. He rose to captain, transferred to the RFC and RAF, flew on the northwest frontier of India, but not in the book. After the war drifted, never fully recovering, he eventually ran away with Molly, a family house parlour maid, and went into <laughs> service with her, ending up bizarrely as a servant at Sandhurst and dying in the 1950s in a poor state. How ironic that a young officer, that young officer cadets were being served by a well-born ex-officer pilot with a distinguished war record. Essentially, he renounced everything to run away with the girl he loved. Now here we see Captain Charles Whitley, who had struck up a great friendship with Edmund Page. Here is Page at Keyboard, remarkably rather jaunty, he's the one with cap back and surely a smirk on his face. <laughs> and his son here tonight would have enjoyed that. But this is the page who will battle through the horrors of Ypres. Their lives were to be closely intertwined in war. Two days after the declaration, Page and Whitley reported to the Cheshires on the strength of service at Bromsgrove and Oxford. But thinking they'd get to France far more quickly as private <coughs> soldiers, they enlisted in the Fusiliers. They were refused permission because they were found to be too valuable as NCOs. So they persuaded Ralph to pull strings, he knew King George V's secretary, and they were given commissions in the King's Royal Rifle Corps. August the infamous Eep Salient. The battalion wasted interminably in a ditch. It poured with rain. Shells came over regularly on the road. Eep was an inferno. The waiting was damnable, the prospect mournful and depressing. Orders arrived to take up a position before dawn astride the men in row. We suffered horrid casualties going through Eep. The Bosch had a very heavy barrage on the road. Discipline in the tail of the column was hard to keep. One man I kicked and threatened to shoot barely had its, its effect. I had never been so frightened. In the morning, they saw us and shelled us with amazing accuracy with air bursts. Half the company was blown to pieces. Charles was wounded as we crouched together behind a hole in which a few men were sheltering. I dressed him. He did not faint. He was hit high up on the right thigh. Half a pair of scissors, which he was carrying, were driven into the wound. He walked off alone with the help of two men. And during that nightmare advance, Edmund Page picked up amid the ruins of the cloth hall a book of common prayer still in the possession of the family, along with the prayer book in which a list of the battles where E.P. used the order for the burial of the dead for many of his men. Three months later, Charles returned, just before Christmas. Not fit, but what a joy to see him. A month later, an old man was killed in the very same place. Leslie Wingfield Sweet Escott of the Oxford Bucks Light Infantry. From the start, he began to make his mark as a leader. And, I, and had I been asked before his death, who was the best officer we had for coolness, courage, and presence of mind for an emergency, or any specially ticklish job, I should have said, without hesitation, Escott. His was the finest kind of courage and self-control of the man who knows what he is in for. He would have gained distinction had he lived. The last two entries of his diary. I pray God that I may be given strength and courage to fight in a manner worthy of my old school. This morning there was Holy Communion in the bar. To fear death is to doubt Christ. 
We of Bromsgrove have learned not to do that. Deo, Reggie, Lucino, and so we go forth. Whatever may be before me, I know that God ordereth to the best. <coughs> to pass early into the Master's garden is a blessing. He had just had his first leave and spent the very last night in England here at school in the boarding house. He expressed the wish that in the event of his falling, his bank balance might be given to the endowment fund. <coughs> he is commemorated on the Menin Gate. A stained glass window has two inscriptions and he trusted in God and was moved from Old Chapel to New and is in the vestibule. His father, governor in turn of the Seychelles, British Honduras and Leeward Islands, permitted the printing of a remarkable poem found in his clothing. An old boy to his school. We don't forget, while in this dark December, you sit in school that we know so well, and hear sounds that keenly we remember. The clock, the hurrying feet, the chapel bell. Others are sitting in the seat we sat in. There's nothing else that's altered there and then. When leaving it, the same old Greek and Latin, you know we don't forget. We don't forget you in the wintry weather, manning the trenches, training in frozen snow. You play the games we used to play together in days of peace that seemed so long ago. But while you're at it all, your games, your cheering, we other hosts in sterner conflict meet, and other sadder sounds our hearts are hearing. Be sure we don't forget. If we, your brothers true, for all your praying, to this dear school of ours return no more, but lie our country's debt of honour paid, and not in vain upon the Belgian shore. Till that great day, when at the throne of heaven, the books are opened and the judgment set, our lives for honour and for England given, our school will not forget. Reginald Hartley was a towering figure at school. Dead ere his prime, for never was a life more full of promise, giving more joyous hopes. Hartley was of those who leave their mark wherever they pass. At school, it seemed only natural that he should be head monitor, football captain, cricket captain, and holder of every office in turn. He had from early youth the rare combination of literary gift and practical efficiency and athletic skill, an appearance of unusual distinction, the keenest interest in nature and in life. The Bronze Grovian, not only when he was himself editor, owed much to his steady pen, and his graceful lines, sung at the slaying of the foundation stone of Kytus, were a tribute which he delighted to offer to the school. The war broke out as he was leaving Oxford, and he hastened to offer himself for service. Military life had no attractions for him, but he knew that he could manage men, and that brought its own reward. It is fitting that he should have fallen in an effort to save one of his wounded. It is the leader's task and in all things, he always led. His short life has been a full one, full of honest work and honest play, and his life and death alike are full of inspiration for those who come after. Meanwhile, I do not apologise for trespassing upon your valuable space, as I consider the matter of which I am writing to be an important one, and one which will appeal to the whole school. I refer to the method which has lately been employed in depriving us of our hair. All appeals to leave us enough hair with which to make a party are in vain, and we leave the hands of the shearer in much the same condition as do sheep. Let us try to look like respectable members of society instead of shaven criminals. Hoping this appeal will find a place in your heart, I am yours, Sean Head. <laughs> Another worry. Old Bronze Grovians have often asked on revisiting the school, has been, is the tunnel still in existence? Or how is the tunnel going? It was our most treasured belonging. We almost worshipped it. Now, sirs, it seems to me that since this is so, and since the tunnel is the most unique part of the school, it ought to be a matter of no trepidation to bring to your notice 
that since the dining room has been transferred to Littleton and the letterbox, the tunnel has only been used by a small minority of the school who pass down it for a fleeting moment when going to breakfast. At other times, its only inhabitants are toads, generally squashed, dead leaves and water. In view of which, sirs, I should like to propose that steps be taken to ensure the tunnel being used by the whole of the school and a means to get an entrance to the library, for instance. It fell into disuse. A dormitory. An array of tiles. Gymnasium left, one of two courts. In-house dining. A classroom in Kytlis with map of the war. Tranquility. We destroyed the fine chimneys in the 80s. I'd have them for those big collars. Off to Stoke Prior. A he or a she, whatever. 100 years old on commemoration day this year. Taken from what is now the piazza in front of humanities. Look at that headmaster's drawing room. Our first lab. Notice the balcony of chimneys. Is he making a point or the boy? And on this one, Sir Thomas will turn in his room. <laughs> Governors, please note, just like the Victorians, they covered walls with photos. Note the cameras, and surely to the left, Lady Hamilton. A second Spreckley was killed on the penultimate day of the year, Arthur Freer. From India, he reached France, where he was wounded in October. He returned to India with his wife and infant child. They took passage in the SS Persia, and all were lost. A Pino liner built in Scotland, torpedoed and sunk off Crete by Commander Max Valentina, and the wreck was located in 2003 at 10,000 feet. Arthur Freer was the best type of English officer. Fierce, resourceful, modest, and good. Though his efficiency and athletics marked him out in the school, he will be remembered by his intimates, not for these, but for a courtesy of manner and innate delicacy of mind, which led to his companionship an indefinable charm. His grave is the sea. Christmas cards are being sent by the headmaster to all serving in his majesty's forces. The cards contain a photo comprising new and old parts of the school. 22 OBs have been killed in 1950.
Helen, bottom right T photo, here in front of Gordon, and also at Camp Wright, was clearly a character at school. But here he is at Lou, in a selfie with the Scottish borders. He gained promotion, even served on Montgomery's staff in the Second War, and landed on D-Day. He led his company with great skill and courage, inspiring confidence in his men by his cheerful example under heavy fire, which enabled them to advance in spite of all opposition. He was severely wounded in the head just before reaching the final objective, but the position was won owing to the impetuous which he had given to the attack, and his skill in maintaining the directions under conditions which were difficult only to miss and die. And here is poor Elkington on a deck chair on the green. His family had discovered silver plates and employing a thousand in the jewellery quarter, supplying the crown heads of Europe. This piece is in the Hermitage St. Petersburg. They also provided these for first class. He was dangerously wounded in the head at Ypres, taken back to the casualty uh, clearing station, but died sadly before his father could get there in time. There are desperately sad telegrams still in the public records office. Like Spreckley, he was one of three brothers to whom the school owes so much. The elder is with the Gloucesters in France, the younger, a midshipman on HMS Indomitable. And, like Spreckley, he is one of those whom country and school can ill spare. At his parents' request, the school motto is proudly inscribed on the headstone, followed by, until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Another of Ralph's boys from Gordon was killed. Uh, top left, Chatter was school monitor, head of house, football 15, cricket 11, gym colours, fires captain, Lance Sargent, OTC. Chatter was killed visiting an isolated position he had only returned from hospital the day before, and though urged by his captain to rest and do not work that night, it was characteristic of him that he should have preferred to do his job. Those who knew him the best feel that he died as he lived. Here at school it was ever his aim to do his job, and whether in work or play, he set a fine example of grit and perseverance. He was an all-round athlete, who won nearly every distinction open to him, which though he will long be remembered as such, it is rather for what he was than for what he did that his many Gonsbrovian friends will cherish his memory. Mr Chattock has kindly presented to Gordon House the sum of £25 to provide an annual prize to his memory. It has been decided to place an oak board in the dining hall, on which the names of prize winners will be inscribed. The prize will be awarded to the best all-round fellow in the house. The prize is still awarded. John Girth Morgan left was a fifth child, known as the Little Girth, the great favourite of all. His brothers went to Shrewsbury and two played for Wales. He played for the 11 and 15, three years in a row, won a Cook scholarship and was teaching in Buenos Aires, but quickly returned. Girth had a shoulder prone to dislocation, which prevented him from being accepted, but he got a doctor friend to certify him fit. He joined the South Wales Borderers in Iraq, who had suffered heavy losses in Gallipoli, and many of the men were newly drafted, inexperienced, and under-trained recruits. He is interred on the banks of the Tigris. Humphrey Humphrey's South Midland Mounted Brigade Field Ambulance wrote, I've been having a pretty awful time. A German Fokker appeared and bombed my hospital. To do gent justice to the gentle Bosch, he probably mistook my hospital marquee for HQ, as he couldn't see my flag from up a lot. I mounted a red X on top, and the next morning, when he sprayed us, he left me alone. For several days, we were worried by Fritz and his machine. On Easter Sunday morning, the storm broke. Our camps were attacked by overwhelming odds of 10 to 1. German Camel Corps interpreted regulars. We were treated to the canal, and I was in and out of the saddle for 30 hours a minute, without a meal before. It wasn't a pleasant experience. My men worked splendidly, and I brought away every wounded man of the force. The Turkish fire was very heavy and accurate, and I had any number of hairbreadth escapes. But all's well that ends well. 
I was personally congratulated I got back, but it was due to as much wonderful work of my mules put in. They pulled the sand carts heavily loaded over more than 40 miles of breakneck sand dunes, and horses were failing right and left. My gallant mare carried me over 70 miles, counting the galloping to and fro during the fighting, and at the end was as game as ever. And read between these lines. I may get a chance soon to send you an uncensored account of the whole business. I cannot say much more as I believe it is intended to represent the whole affair as a British victory, but you will draw your own conclusions as you count up the casualties. They are sure to be trickled out gradually. All my kit has been captured by the Turks. I have only the clothes I stand up in. I am quite well unwounded, so don't worry. The two OBs did die on that ill-fated Easter day in the Battle of Katia, a great disaster for the British. The one in which the Worcestershire Yeoman fought valiantly, and one was the school doctor. Dr. Bealby was born in Midlothian, educated at Edinburgh and Vienna, was our medical officer, surgeon to the Cottage Hospital, bailiff, member of the district and county council, and resided at Henry Hall. An Ottoman force, led by General von Kressenstein, made a surprise attack. Arthur Valentine Holyoak left Queen's own Worcestershire Hussars was there too. At the end, in thick fog, a sentry reported that he could hear voices. The main body of the enemy came up, and the hill of Obertina was surrounded. The yeomanry could have got away, but would have had to leave the dismounted engineers to their fate. There was only one thing to do. Stay and fight it out. Of 20 officers and 230 men, only nine officers and 56 men were left, and most of them were wounded. And the official history described it as a lamentable occurrence, resulting in the total loss of three and a half squadrons of the enemy, but otherwise it had no effect. It has surprised no one who knew him that he met his end in an effort to help others. Captain Bilby decided, decided declined to retire with the others, but remained behind to attend to a wounded officer. He was never seen again. For 20 years he has been a school doctor and its firm friend. It was not easy to find the limits of his kindness and good temper, though both must have been sorely tried. To hold the balance so fairly that no malingerer is allowed to shout and none really unfit is allowed to play is no light task. A member of the first 15 was quite wantonly rude when he was forbidden to take part in a match. Dr. Beale declined to have any apology offered or rebuke administered on the grounds that anyone whose liver was so out of order might be pardoned much. He lavished on the school an unselfish and unceasing care. Always courteous, punctual, sympathetic, loyal. There was no need for him to go to the front. No need for him to give his life as he did. Being himself, he could not do otherwise. We offer to Mrs. Bealby and the boys the sympathy of those who knew his work. His name is on the Jerusalem Memorial. Holyoke lived in Hazeldean, his father a well-known local solicitor. He was captured at the same battle and marched with 8,000 from Egypt through Damascus, Jerusalem, Damascus, Beirut, Aleppo, Ankara, to a prisoner of war camp at Yozgat. Many died on the way and at the camp, which was at four and a half thousand feet. But he did organise whilst there fox hunting, a theatre and a Masonic lodge. It is the only story we have of the capture of an OB. The enemy was so near that I got out my wall with the chart. I hated the idea of being bayoneted. I was a very poor shot with my revolver and I began to wonder how near I ought to let them get near before I fired. Suddenly I heard the call's voice, cease fire. I expected fixed bayonets, then charge. It had never occurred to me that we would surrender. Put down your arms and hold up your hands, was the next order. I hurriedly dropped my revolver onto the sand and buried it with my feet. As I stood up, expecting to be shot, Bullets were still coming on, but most of the Turks came forward and began looting from us anything that appealed to them. At the same time, motioning us towards their rear. A big Anatolian pointed out the direction in which he wanted me to go. There was a sand hill just in front, and I went to the left. Two of our men to the right, and to my horror, I saw them both bayoneted by Turks. 
On the whole, the Turks behaved well. Captain Murray was reported missing and died in a German field hospital. They debated that it is not in the interest of the Allies that the United States should join the war. Payne considered that the Americans would take a great deal but do very little. Forget the Germans. What is it, croaks without the hall, where studiously great and small are toiling and annoys them all? The corn croak. What grates away in rain and mud and makes you long to spill its blood or hold its head beneath the flood? The corn croak. Oh, for a bomb to stop that great, may gas or shell asphyxiate and utterly annihilate the corn croak. Captain Hux was almost 40, the oldest OB to die in battle. Only a week ago he went over our power pet under machine gun fire to bring in a wounded man. His company was in the hottest part of our section, but he never lost his smile and spent hours walking along his trench and cheering up his men. Page and Whitley were now at the Somme. The battalion was to capture orchards at dawn. Charles's C Company were in front and B Company, commanded by Evan Page, in support. The bombardment and retaliation were terrific. Charles led his company with two pistols and a stick with wonderful gallantry. A piece of shrapnel went straight through his right forearm before the attack started, but we could not persuade him to go back. The battalion lost 20 officers and two-thirds of its strength. That led to the military cross for conspicuous gallantry in action. He had remained on duty 12 hours after being hit. Commemoration day will be kept quietly again this year. The song. Three died in the first three days of July, two on the first day of the month. Another of Ralph's Gordonians and head monitors was killed. Captain Tasker was an only son and... In January he married and went to the front. He leaves a widow and a little son aged three months. Considerable improvements have been made to the heating of the chapel. The old stone has been removed and gas radiators installed. Two are in the aisle. One near the reading desk, and one in the headmaster's pew. Ralph kept <laughs> Ralph kept warm. Zeppelins were a threat, so... To conform with lighting restrictions, big school windows have been treated with coats of green distemper. Reginald Skelton was one of our most distinguished OBs and accumulated several honours at the Battle of Judgment on the White Sea at Archangel. And some of you will know that he was on Scott's first expedition, begged to go on the second, was turned down, and was replaced by a man who died with Scott. <coughs> Douglas Estill from Johannesburg was killed in the magnificent stand made in Delvin Wood. The battle is of particular importance to South Africa, as it was the first major engagement of their first infantry brigade. Their casualties were catastrophic losses of 80%, yet they held the wood as water. This feat has been described as the bloodiest battle held of 1916. School finished in August, the OTC paraded before a march of eight miles and an abnormally hot one to camp at Hadley Hall, rather than the officers travelled by the Great Western Railway. The account is eloquent about him. The fact that the headmaster was able to find time to spend the whole nine days in camp gave us all the keenest pleasure. It is hard to say what camp would, be, would have been without him and what he did. After church parade, Lord Cobham inspected the corps and delivered a very stirring address. Of the pleasant memories, probably the best of the time we passed listening to the gramophone, the delight of cooling oneself on a stifling afternoon in an open air bathroom, under huge trees that glistened and dropped with water from the spraying of the cold showers, and under them was the only cool place. Or yet again, standing in the glow and warmth of the cookhouse fire at three o'clock in the morning, and pondering the loneliness and silence of the night. And what of the sing song? What of the canteen? What of the ubiquitous gramophone? What of the excellent food? What of visitors' day? What of the headmaster with us always? And the last memory of everyone will be that of lying in his tent and listening to the tuneful, or otherwise, good nights. And mark you once and for all the weather. Perfect. Captain Stewart, Colonel Granges, was seconded to Nigeria, and it, and it was not until 1916 that he obtained his wish to go to the front. 
He was severely wounded. His recovery had been hoped for, but Africa had sapped his strength, and there was not sufficient resisting power. He was cheerful to the last, sending a message of comfort to his mother and thanking her for all that she had done for him. Leonard Cameron Kidd, Royal Flying Corps, was the first OB pilot to be killed. He was tea planting in Ceylon when the war broke out, but returned as soon as possible and at once obtained a commission as he was already in possession of a pilot certificate. He has been flying continuously. And his diary could have come from the Biggles book with the gung-ho recklessness of youth. He was twice lost in snowstorms and once landed in a field, but plunged over a ten-foot ditch, through a hedge and finally into a corner of a wood, smashing the machine to atoms, but escaping with a bruised ankle. But in one of the most devastating passages tonight. Yesterday, I walked through Freikorp. Never again will I go over a battlefield if I can help it. No words can describe it. Not a brick left standing, and the whole place full of smoking holes of dugouts and shattered bodies. God knows how the wretched infantry stand it. I'm sure I don't. They say that it's the airman's point of view. He has all the sport and a minimum of the danger. But no pilots have parachutes in this war. A week before he died, I am alive and kicking, and enjoying myself tremendously. We had great sport a few days ago. We came to within 500 feet and sprayed a lot of the enemy in a dugout. I never laughed so much in my life. They didn't know which way to run, and we bagged the whole lot of them. Two days before he was killed, he was elated. Cheer up. I got my military cross today. Thank goodness. I did want something to show for the song job. I got my machine well straight by machine gun fire three days ago and again yesterday. At the last show, I had the left claim main, the left claim main spark shot away, also a fuselage strut. One through the rudder post and five through the plane about six inches from my head. <coughs> yesterday, I had one come up through the floor. His final entry. I had a rotten time the other evening. We had just finished our reconnaissance job over enemy lines signalling shots to batteries and had started home when an inlet pipe blew off and I had to land among shells. We landed all right somehow. The mechanic arrived two hours later and took the machine to pieces and we got back here at 1.30am. It was an awful sweat getting the fuselage to the road, pushing it over trenches and shell holes. He was killed by friendly fire. His CO wrote... He was hit by one of our own shells when flying over the German lines at 1,500 feet. He is a great loss to the squadron and was one of the pluckiest pilots I've ever known, as he was continually doing daring work. The only consolation I can offer you is that he was killed instantaneously and in doing his duty for his country. A fellow pilot wrote, He was universally loved. I enclosed one of his maps, on which I have marked with an X, the position where the machine now lies. There were just two houses, Gordon and School, but... All is not well with house matches. SH is twice as large as GH. In the last 12 years, 22 football matches have been played, of which SH has won 15 and GH 7, the former scoring 450 points and the latter 123. In cricket, SH has won 8 times and GH 4 times. What is one of these three houses of equal size? Let SH be divided up into two houses. Suitable names can be found without difficulty. Schoolhouse disappeared from the sports field. After the present term, the schoolhouse is to be divided into Littleton and Millington. As the year closed, there was a concert in Big School, attended by poet Lawrence Binion, who wrote the most famous lines in the remembrance service. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. 23 of these have been killed in 1960.
Jane. Grafton Manor Pines soon bought and rusty old skates were brought out and burnished and new. For only patriarchs can remember the last time they were skating at Bromsbury. A half holiday was granted by the headmaster. Land boys? The headmaster informed the school that their services had been offered to neighbouring farmers. One meatless day is now enforced throughout the school. There will be no leave on Friday to any shops that sell food. Yes, sir. We are consuming more than our appointed weekly rations. May I suggest an obvious solution? Let us get up an hour later in the morning. And the next full of he who sleeps forgets his hunger. Day boys were few and were houseless, and they had to wear a red ribbon. Now that it has been realised that a division of houses is desirable, may I put a plea for the day boys? You cannot run at 11, much less at 15, and the day boy token on sports day is mere mockery. Yet, it is hardly our fault. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Could we not be a portion of among the new houses? Humphrey Humphreys, Suez. I think it probable we shall be in France before the summer. We are all much encouraged at the prospect. I have been employed on side shows so long that I badly want to see something of a big push before the war is over. The editor. There was one noticeable feature in our last number, which we deeply regret that we cannot repeat in this. It was almost the first issue since the war began in which our OB news contained no names of OBs killed in action. A party of wounded soldiers came over from Blackwell Sanatorium. They were received by the monitors, watched the Gordon Millington match, and afterwards were entertained to tea and a small concert in the gymnasium, the soldiers contributing some of the items. They departed in excellent spirits, in a break to the accompaniment of much cheering on the part of the school. House colours were introduced. I want to take my way a Charford's grassy sward. It was upon a house match day. The school did walk abroad with ribbons and rosettes galore of mauve and brown and green. One of the most cherished institutions at Bromsbury in the summer is bathing. To come hot and dusty and paddle about the baths at will or bask in the sun, clad in a bath towel, toga fashion. But cricket prospects were poor. The lack of a groundsman, the shortage of petrol for the motor, the difficulty of obtaining matches, and the demands made by military and agricultural authorities combined, combined to make the lot of the captain of cricket far from enviable, and he has our sympathy. Dent was killed by a shell which demolished the building where he was having afternoon tea. His wife and little daughter survived him. Charles Whitley now lost his life in an attack that typifies our traditional view of the war. Edwin Page again. We expected to get relief for troops were disheartening and short and we went into battle tired men. In position, shivering with nerves and cold in a drizzle of snow and sleet. Orders reached us with zero hour was postponed to 24 hours. I shall never forget those hours of waiting while our artillery finished their work. Just before dawn, I talked to Charles. His spirits were wonderful. He knew his company loved him and would go anywhere with him. His young officers were desperately nervous, but Charles' amazing spirit kept them going. At 1am, we were visited in freezing trenches by Brigadier General Skinner, sent to discover why the advance had halted. It was soon obvious to him that any advance up the hill was sheer madness until Hill 90 had been taken. Skinner sent back his situation report, which was overruled. The attack on Wonderport would take place. At 4.30, the attack orders arrived, and in spite of all our protests, we were ordered to carry them out. One division never left the trenches, but B Company, under Whitley, made a most gallant attempt to push forward. But from the start, it was an impossible task, and the staff who had ordered the attack, if they had ever come near enough to have looked at the ground, would have realised it too, and would never have ordered the attack. Whitley's body was found nearest the wire, which was totally uncut. The whole show was a complete failure from want of preparation and organisation on the part of the staff. They lost all 12 officers, but the irony is that during that same night, the enemy cleared out abandoning Hill 90. Charles died instantly from MG bullets, carrying away the lower part of his spine. 
Sergeant Melville bought me some of his things and broke down and told me what he had done for them. Whitley had never had to work. His father was MP for Liverpool and Everton in turn. He is one of the 12 statues in the magnificent St George's Hall, Liverpool, alongside Gladstone and Peel. They lived in Cheshire, but had a townhouse in Piccadilly. After Oxford, he had worked to help poor dockers in the slums of Liverpool. And our science block was built to that man's memory and known as the Whitley Laboratories. And in 2010, prior to Commemoration Day and the imminent opening of the refurbished and expanded facilities, we remembered this fine young man, whom Ralph called the third founder of the, of the school. He is one of the few names read out by our headmaster in the bidding prayer at St John's. So he is with monarchs, baronets and lords. How delighted Charles would have been to know that we gathered there on that day. How proud Edmund Page would have been to know that we remembered his gift of the original building and to know that his sons and a grandson were present. And we're honoured with son Jim's presence tonight. And he would not be here tonight if his father had not got through the First World War. Cecil Cutler, RFC, was killed flying. Don't they look like Spitfire pilots? And he looks RAF. <laughs> Private Price, Saskatchewan Regiment, fought in the great battle of Vimy Ridge. He is remembered on that vast monument and is watched over and lamented by Mother Canada. A third Spreckley fell, Guy Lessingham. Spreckley farmed in New Zealand, but in 1914 was back in England and joined two other OBs in dairy farming. Refusing a commission, he went out as sergeant. He met his end in the great advance of this year. Setting the noblest example of personal bravery to his men, he was in command of his company, was wounded early in the action and refused to go back. Wounded again, he still kept on, but a third missile struck him and he fell down in the moment. He is commemorated on the men again. He and his two brothers stood here for everything that was sportsmanlike and manly. Differing greatly in their respective gifts, they were alike in the service they rendered the school and in the affection they felt for her. The youngest fell, the eldest drowned. Now GL has rejoined them. They leave behind them a wonderful record of clean, healthy lives and of unusual courage. They would be the first to bid us not to mourn their loss, but ourselves to do our share. And the family then added a plaque to the reading desk in front of us. We have perpetuated an incorrect legend for some time. There was a fourth son, Herbert, who did not attend Bromsgrove, who joined the Royal Navy at 12, survived and died in 1974. He was educated at Dartmouth. But having lost her three Bromsgrove children, Mrs. Spreckley was the parent invited to lay the foundation stone of the Memorial Chapel. Ironic today that those cigarettes have been warmly welcomed. Dear sir, being one of the younger generations of Bromsgroveians at the front, and having spent over a year of war at the school, I should like to say with what intense pleasure I received a box of cigarettes from the school. While at Bromsgrove, I regarded quite impersonally and almost mechanically the gifts of cigarettes that we used to send to OBs. But when a similar gift arrived for me, it brought an entirely new feeling. It was a real and personal message from the school. A vivid reminder of old days and old associations. And above all, a personal assurance that I was not forgotten. It is that which is most treasured out here and it is that for which I cannot find words to thank the school as I would. The memory of Bromsgrove is ever with me, and I long for the time when I can see the school again. With best wishes for success in everything, I remain yours sincerely, O.B. France. War seemed far away that summer. All seems to have gone with great smoothness, the machinery being greased by those necessities of a good term, good health, and good weather. One interrupted afternoon's cricket is the sum total of inconvenience caused by rain. No academic and the sanatorium has had but few occupants. 
energetic people with necks and bottles range the countryside at intervals. Nowhere is one safe from the tip of the camera. We wish those going farming in the holidays the best of good luck and good weather. E.G. Evelyn, <coughs> centre, captain, was gassed. Born in Florence, he spoke English, Italian and German, and he transferred to the Intelligence Corps, <coughs> served again in World War II, and in 1961 wrote With My Little Eye about spies in both world wars. He looks like a spy. <laughs> and at the beginning of his book, he said that it was not worth mentioning his school record. <laughs> Captain Huggett was killed, acting as an intelligence officer. And his colonel speaks very warmly of his capacity as a soldier and his qualities as a man. His elder brother died at Gallipoli. The boys were born at Dungannon, County Tyrone, where their names are inscribed on the war memorial. And one of the most moving pictures tonight is one of their father cheering troops on their way. He was to lose both his boys. Second Lieutenant Frank Bernard Wern, Essex Regiment, top right. In this team looks a rather unlikely hero, but is to be awarded the VC. He had already been severely wounded and... It was only in May that he was able to go on active service again, and the end came in a few weeks. His Majesty the King has been graciously pleased to approve of the award of the Victoria Cross to the undermentioned officer. For most conspicuous bravery when in command of a small party in a raid on the enemy's trenches, he gained his objective in the face of much opposition, and by his magnificent example and daring, was able to maintain his position for a considerable time, according to instructions. Grasping the fact that if the left flank was lost, his men would have to give way, Worm leapt onto the parapet and ran along the top of the trench, firing and throwing bombs. This unexpected and daring manoeuvre threw the enemy off his guard and back in disorder. This gallant officer was severely hit for the second and third time, and more to be wounded. And in one of the most memorable assemblies in our history, on the first day of term, that account was read by the headmaster, the whole school standing throughout. A letter from his Batman, Private Voller, to his parents included this. A bomb landed between us. Mr. Worm received his first wound in the leg and would have been fully justified in going back, but he utterly refused to go. I bound him up as best I could. However, the enemy having retired, I got him into the trench, where he sat directing things as coolly as ever. I think I will go back, Carl, if you will help me. But he was hit again on the forehead, and yet again on the back of the neck. When I saw his face, sir, I knew beyond doubt that my officer was dying. I sat beside him, holding his helmet over his face to keep off flying stones. He turned to me and said, You have done well, Holler. Tell. And then he died, with the same smile on his face it always wore when it was pleased. Five men helped carry his body. One of those was killed too. I would this tale had a different ending. <coughs> Believe me, I did my best. How to remember the dead. An historic meeting and decision. Sir F.W. Fryer, Governor of Burma, presiding in the cook's room. The headmaster stated that three proposals had been made. To enlarge the present chapel, to found scholarships, and to build a new chapel. Rare requests to raise, to raise a large sum for a permanent memorial in the form of a new building. The chapel, in view of the growing numbers, was a pressing need and was the most fitting memorial in that it would enshrine the spirit which led to the sacrifice and could contain in itself a visible reminder of those who had fallen. Other proposals were withdrawn. B.F. Braithwaite's machine was attacked by four German aeroplanes. He was seen getting out and being led away by Germans. The school was expanding. The lower fourth has been divided into two parallel forms. There are 158 boys in the school. Sergeant Percy Henning was headmaster of Crowell School. 
Nothing has been heard of him, and his death is presumed by the war. The Braziers are a famous local family and built most of our buildings from 1850 to the 1980s. Albert Royal Warwickshire's was killed by the bursting of a shell and is remembered at Tyne Cot. A service was held on All Saints Day. Ralph preached and the anthem was they were lovely and pleasant in their lives. The editor was stoical. This term, as every well-behaved term should, has passed quickly. It is very difficult to settle down to a serious year's work, with the uncertainty caused by the war still continuing. We cannot help wondering whether, we'll, whether we will be just the same next year, or whether still more radical changes will have been made in our existence. But we are not pessimistic, and while we, are, while we are still allowed our customary games, we will not complain. We are very glad to be going home several days before the date originally arranged, only to the representation of trade. The Spreckies presented a football cup with the inscription, They played the game. The 15 played Dover College, relocated to Levington Spa, the RFC and Northumberland Fusiliers. They received a letter from Braithwaite in hospital in Germany with a bullet through the left foot and cut about the face, but... Not badly wounded. And on display tonight, C.A. Green's OTC certificate, the telegram from King George V and Queen Mary, deeply regretting the loss you and the army have sustained, and the usual dead man's penny given to his family. 25 OBs have been killed in 1917. Bye. 
L.W. Moore, O.B., took evocative photographs around Cambrai, which encapsulates our image of the war. He survived. We apologise for the lateness of this number. Of course, the war is responsible. How invaluable this one word is to a careworn editor. But for the benefit of the curious, the printing of food cards was considered more pressing even than our own timely appearance. The number of boys is greater than it has ever been. There are 170, of whom eight are in Elmshurst and Overflow House. But a real outrage on our doorstep. <laughs> Sir, certain poor children in the town have gained possession of school caps and are wearing them. Something should be done to prevent it. Yours, disgusted. <laughs> Captain Judy, seated on the floor, was awarded the Croix de Guerre, but fell in the March Offensive. His last words were, Tell the Colonel I have done my best. And Private Wheelock, Royal Inniskillen Fusiliers. After leaving school, Wheelock was a clerk in Lloyd's Bank, Bromsbury. Percy Dean was 41 when he won the Victoria Cross. He enjoyed sailing and joined the Naval Volunteer Reserve, but could never have imagined in his wildest dreams the heroic actions he would perform in a famous raid on Zebra. Three old warships were to be scuffled to block the harbour at the mouth of the Bruges Canal and trap the German fleet. HMS Vindictive was to land 200 men to disable the German shore batteries, and volunteer yachtsmen were to captain motorboats to evacuate sailors from the sunken ships. Dean captained ML 282, and after the rescue, the frail boats could escape past the, by then, disabled batteries. It went badly wrong. One ship hit an obstruction and sank prematurely. The other two were sunk successfully at the narrowest point. Dean manoeuvred his launch under enemy fire as 26 batteries and 229 machine guns fired down. HMS Vindictive had come alongside the mole at the wrong place and guns could not be silenced. The tiny motorboats were under intense fire. But Dean saved 100 lives. His boat was in the harbour for an hour and went furthest up the canal to rescue men. While leaving, three crewmen standing next to him were killed, but he heard an officer was in the water and immediately turned down, turned around, and hauled him aboard. Then the steering mechanism broke down. All seemed lost, but he manoeuvred the boat under the mole so that guns could not be depressed sufficiently to hit it. Once out of harbour, he found himself alone and facing a 65-mile journey to the nearest port. But HMS Warwick came to his aid. London Gazette. It was solely due to this officer's courage and daring that ML-282 succeeded in saving so many lives. The VC was presented to him at Buckingham Palace, and he was also one of the 100 VC survivors, Guard of Honour, at the burial of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. He became MP for Blackburn, defeating pacifist Philip Snowden, who became Labour Chancellor of Exchequer, and Dean came to commemoration annually and was a hero to, to the boys. He died in London in 1939 and is commemorated in Golders Green, Blackburn Town, Town Hall. His family ran a slate business and at Zeebrugger. And there is a wonderfully eloquent obituary in the Times. What man of a man was this slate merchant of Blackburn? He was tall and fair with fresh complexion, fine blue eyes, shrewd, frank, usually hum humorous, and pretty fearless eyes. This father died when he was young and he rescued the family business with his attractively forceful personality, his energy and very considerable business and administrative ability. All his spare time from Easter to September for many years before the war was spent in cruising small boats in Liverpool Bay and the Menai Straits with a cruise to the Irish and Scottish coasts in his summer holidays. He was full of fun, the best companion a man could find in fair or dirty weather ashore or afloat. He was good company and to be depended on. To his shipmates, from the Baltic to the North Sea, down Channel to the Hebrides, the seas have lost some of their savour with his passing. We shall not see his life again in the little ships that sail the narrow seas. A great personality is gone, leaving behind affection, 
happy memories, and a fine example of manliness and service. A DFC went to William Miles Thomas, who flew in Mesopotamia with the brand new Royal Air Force, founded in April. He became a baron, managing Morris Motors, and then chairman of BOAC during the comet crashes. He wrote the first guide to London, Heathrow Airport. Sir Lionel Whitby was our most distinguished medical OB. He lost a leg in 1918, treated King George V in a near-fatal illness, and travelled as one of Churchill's doctors on several long journeys, and set up the first national blood transfusion service in this country. The Corps was busy. <laughs> the Enfield 1914 pattern rifles are enormously better than the rather inferior rifles we had to use. Field day at Morven was followed by a march back to Worcester, where, through the kindness of the mayor, it had what tea is possible in these days in the Guild Hall. Seventy cadets will be harvesting near Newport. NF Hall recorded a story about the locker. All boys studied at night together in big school. A great deal of the responsibility for the discipline of the school fell upon Rack, <coughs> as younger masters were not available. We expected a somewhat ineffective temporary master to take lock-up. We arranged to receive him by kicking an empty waste paper basket down the gangway as he walked up. First move he played with me. I kicked the basket towards Emily, but at this moment I was impressed by the stillness that had fallen upon the audience and looked up to see that Ralph had come in instead. As he went out, he said, Paul. Come and see me after supper. <laughs> Disciplined and awaited, but instead, instead, such loving kindness. I knocked on the study door. No answer. I poked my head inside. R.G. was sitting in a chair reading. I went up. I shifted my feet. I coughed. His deafness was never more impenetrable. <laughs> After an eternity, he looked up at the start and said, Oh, Hall, are you there? I have Edmund Page coming to breakfast tomorrow. Will you join us? Page was on leave and in the same unit as one of Hall's brothers. Embry was shot down over France in 1940, captured by the German army, was marching through a village, spelt Embry, thought it was his lucky day, rolled down the bank, escaped, and became a commander-in-chief of Fighter Command as the war ended. We are weeks away now, but six were to die in October. Captain Keppel Palmer in one of the first tanks. Private Bentley at over 40, one of the oldest to die. A volunteer stretcher bearer, he was reported as missing, presumed killed in action. He was a bachelor, devoted to his library and a keen fly fisherman. Captain Carter's high character and modest charm won for him a position of influence and esteem. Naturally of a retiring disposition, he hated prominence. His monitorship and cricket captaincy were both undertaken from a sense of duty which was conspicuous in all he did, and which led him, for he had no love of soldiering, to take a commission as soon as possible after the outbreak of war. Twice severely wounded, he was killed instantaneously by a shell in his tent. In him there passed one of those gentle yet brave spirits who sweeten life for others and lend them unconsciously a greater strength. At last.
on Sunday evening, the 17th of November, the school attended a special service of thanksgiving in St. John's. The end of the war, about which everyone had talked so much, seems to have come at last. And with a suddenness which has quite upset us, and from which we are only just beginning to recover. Armistice Day passed here amid scenes which quite outshone the efforts of our predecessors at the end of the South African War. But for all that, we find it almost impossible to realise that at this moment there is no one being killed in the whole extent of Flanders and the other battlefronts. To realise that our role of honour has come to an end at last and that we who are here will never be able to bear our part. You must now imagine a scene just outside this very building on the green, because a more formal, informal account of our Mistress Day was recorded, in which the excitement of the boys is very evident, but so too the impact of the stress upon Ralph. We have known that something was in the air. I was standing on the top of Kiteless' steps at 11 o'clock when three black crocodiles began to weave across the playground, one coming from school, another from Gordon House, and the third from the outhouse, day boys attending at the old gate. They were halfway across the playground when the maroons went up. Each crocodile froze into stillness for a brief second. There was no guidance and no direction. They converged on the chapel and settled themselves there and waited for 20 minutes before the chaplain arrived to conduct a spontaneous service. Thereafter, work was discontinued. In the early afternoon, a number of boys from different houses went down to town in various forms of fancy dress to find the town also on fit. The school had recovered itself by four o'clock, a normal classroom at 4.15. RG had been in London and had neither seen nor yet heard of all that had taken place. He returned at nine and was furious. We were going to bed when messages came round that all who had taken part in the demonstration in town were to report immediately to his study. He was a shame gray with fatigue and emotional strain and made some very cutting remarks about the disgraceful scene that had taken place in his absence. Dancing on the graves of dead ones Romans was one sentence. Next morning, he had heard a more complete account of Armistice Day. He did not lose summon us. But in addressing the school to announce a morning off after prayers, he went out of his way to refer in very different terms to the proceedings of the previous day. And then, at such a moment, came the great flu pandemic. Boys, masters, nurses alike fell before it. Ten boys were gravely ill, and there was a day when not more than 40 boys could be mustered for school. The plague lasted a month. Disorganising work, OTC and football, influenza, Spanish influenza, malarial fever, trench fever, septic pneumonia, call it what you will, we have had it. Practically everyone has had it. At our lowest everywhere, even the school doctor succumbed. But no one died. Word reached Ralph that the Charford property which the school held on a short lease was up for sale, and that the owners of the lint mill by the stream were in the market to expand, expand into our land. This, as RG wrote, would have been an almost mortal blow to the school's future. But he met the owners, set the case before them, and the upshot was that the school gained the freehold of its playing fields. We could have lost Lower Charford. In the last year of the war, 18 OBs had been killed.
the War Office thanked the OTC and presented two German guns. Three died from wounds in 1919, and R.D. Cotton from Finsbury is the only one interred close to his school in Bromsburg Cemetery. Arthur Holyoke was repatriated enjoying a peace dinner and travelling by rail from Ankara in 31 days. He was at Cherbourg on the 30th of December and took the Queen Margaret and Isle of Man packet to Southampton. Many were hopelessly seasick on the channel but tried to sing all Lang Syne as they saw land. New Year's Day and England at last. He returned to the family law firm in Bromsgrove, married, had two sons, wrote a book about Droitwich and died in his bed peacefully in 1977 at Woodfall. He could have been killed at that sand dune just as two of his friends were. Arthur Chater Pepper left and John Rupert Wilson Wright on a yacht in the late twenties. Pepper flew, was shot down and made a prisoner of war and the headmaster still announces the award in his name at commemoration. Wilson, Royal Sussex, is a different tale. He was blown up and left for dead in no man's land. And very soon after this photograph with his family, he committed suicide in 1932. Deceased had been very depressed ever since he came from the war. Witnesses had known him from a child, and before the war he was bright and cheerful, but after he came back, he did not see the same man. We believe that 427 Old Bronze Grovians served and that 93 died. How Charford loves the summer's long caresses and whispered memories of happy days. She gazes idly on the mimic strife of bat and ball, on panting hearts and life. Like some great giant on his elbow leaning, old kiteless lies and listens to the cries that gladly daunt defeat and welcome winning watches the restless horses scold the flies. Deep hidden in the nodding chestnut's shade, the playground dreams the afternoon away. The school for us is peopled by her dead, who found in duty more than lies in fame, who dared with us and suffered and are sped. The chapel whispers each unanswered name at every corner, some remembered face smiles and is gone and courage takes its place. The way is long, we will not stay to breathe. For hope is memory divorced from sorrow. The future what the past could not achieve. And courage never hesitates to borrow what danger lends, pays interest in pain. And, losing all, will gladly dare again. The first proper commemoration since 1914, the most emotional in our history. Right. Five years ago, we were gathered here for our last commemoration. Today, in the parish church, we have rehearsed for the last time the list of those who have done honour to the school and added to the luster of her name. I do not wish to add any sadness to this occasion by thinking or dwelling too much upon the past. But it would be the desire of the present generation, as it is my own, that we should not let today pass without thanking both those who are dead and those who are living for what they have done in these last years for England and for us. A pause. For God, King, for neighbour. Through long years, the words have been blazoned on the walls of this school, but they have been spelled for us anew by sons of Bromsgrove in splendid deeds. We shall raise to them a worthy memorial, a new chapel, that which we think they would all most have desired, but we can raise no memorial which can compare with that with which they have erected to themselves, an example for future generations. <coughs> Applause. These last five years, which have been difficult for the country, have been not less difficult years for schools. I want to thank parents for the consideration and confidence which they have shown us through that trying time. 
It has not been possible to keep things educationally up to the usual pitch. We could not help ourselves. I desire also to thank my colleagues for all the help they have given during this difficult time. A pause, but Ralph's last words were typically a tribute <coughs> to the boys. I want to thank the boys, especially the elder ones, who have borne a burden very unusual to be laid upon fellows of their age. While those of the older generation have been doing their duty nobly on wider fields, the present generation has, to a very large measure, been doing its duty remarkably well within the walls of the school. A pause. A modest man of deep faith, Ralph led Bromsgrove School with quiet reassurance. <coughs> Staffing difficulties mounted. There was no end to the extraneous parts that he himself played. As a speaker for many a wartime cause, a consultant for neighbours in trouble, a tireless kitchen gardener. And at the camp at Hagley, he was honorary chaplain, banker, postmaster, public relations officer, and above all, the most welcome of guests in every tent. The account of that camp included a tribute to him that sums up best his leadership of the school. Let us signify our gratitude to the headmaster, who was with us always. A master reminiscent. Those many who received letters from him while on service will understand the telling of this story by one of his colleagues, who not uselessly, for he could not hear, very late on his study door, entering he saw no one, but there was a little pile on the desk, showing that R.G.'s nightly pile of letters was done. Only as he turned to leave to the visitor see him, still unaware of any intrusion on his knees. I am privileged to <coughs> occupy Routh's study, and I often think of him opening letters and telegrams, writing to bereaved parents, and reflecting on what words to say yet again to the school over those long years. And even, of course, telling boys in his study that their brothers had been killed. Many OBs had qualified to be officers whilst here in the OTC. And when war began, they all went to him to sign their blue forms to state that they had Certificate A. If you look at Travers's record in the Public Record Office, the blue form is still there, signed by Ralph. For he was instrumental in getting these boys commissions. And we have to say it, indirectly of course, to their deaths because the casualty rates of young officers were so great. What happened in his mind once the 1920s began and the great reaction against this war set in? I look out towards Kyklus and Chapel. Did he not do the same and look out on Kyklus, but also see in his mind's eye beyond and his vision of a memorial chapel? We honour the memory of the fallen tonight, but also the leadership of one great, humble man. One can understand his utter determination to build a memorial chapel and to see it finished, albeit as late as 1960. And his address at the completion must surely be the greatest ever made by a headmaster of our school. He had completely lost his hearing but not his eloquence or passion. 91 years of age, he stood like a pillar of rock in the sanctuary. He only moved when he came to the chancel steps to preach. He made a robust sermon, speaking in a firm, clear voice. He did not move his head, his hands, or his feet, and made no gestures. Never, he said, never let anyone come in here without reverence for those in whose memory this building stands. His voice broke slightly with emotion and he was heard in awed silence. They were his boys. He knew them all. He remembered. And so should we.
which would be right and proper to have stopped at that moment. But I know you all want me to say a thank you to the people who have made this wonderful evening possible. And an evening which reflects so well on both the past and the present members of the school. We obviously continue to be delighted with the rising star which is Bromsgrove in the present generation. And we've had some evidence of the outstanding performances that these young people can produce at the present time. Our young readers, Emily, Ellie, Declan and Niall, and the musicians, William, Lucy and Sam, and all of whom have uh, played instruments for us this evening. And perhaps just at this moment we should pause to give them a special thank you. Many others have been involved behind the scenes and they're mentioned in your programmes and deserving also of our thanks. Do read carefully all the people who worked so hard to put on this wonderful presentation this evening. Uh, those are to be found in the programme notes. But while we glory in the success of the school present, this evening has been very much about the school in the past. How they made sacrifices which laid the foundation and sowed the seeds which become the spirit of the school today. It's interesting to think that these young people on either side of me would have been going off to war within months of leaving school at the age that they are. In the proper attempt to commemorate the events of a century ago, the school has been researching and publishing information about their former pupils. Uh, two people have been collecting information about all schools across the country at this time in their histories. So I can't think, having listened to them speaking about uh, what they found, Mr. Selden, Mr. Walsh, that there are any schools that could hold their heads any higher than uh, that which we could do here at Bronzeville when there were so many casualties in such a small number of people. And five VCs uh, to add to all that. All these old ones and their actions and sacrifices belong now to an age which we can only reach by reflecting on memories. But that the current generation cares is shown by the fact that it is a capacity audience here this evening. And I do thank you all very much for coming. The very considerable distances have been travelled as some very distinguished people with long, much longer standing connections of Bromsgrove than mine are here tonight. And we thank you very much for coming to support this special evening and hopefully afterwards to support the purchase of the history as well. Uh, there's one person who has been at the heart of everything that's uh, been presented to us this evening who is indeed at the centre of so much of what people today know and feel about Bromsgrove School and who has dedicated so much of his time and effort in the past months to ensuring that the school community has a proper record of the remarkable people and their experience in those war years so early in the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to stand and applaud Philip Bowen, and bear in mind the people who made the ultimate sacrifice for him. Please stand.
OBs, present pupils, support staff. It's been a wonderful evening for this community and uh, Ralph would have been very proud of us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.